So we have a series of questions we're going to go through, but before we do the questions, I, I thought I would just ask each of our panelists to, in a few sentences, introduce their company. You know, we know the names, but maybe we don't know the, the magnitude, the revenue, if you will, of the non-ophthalmic versus the ophthalmic and the sort of strategic focus broadly of, uh, of the ophthalmic interest. So let's start on the far end with Jerry. Introduce your, yourself and your company and, and what is ophthalmic about Sun and, and uh, where, you know, what do you have? Sure. Thank you very much, Emmett. My name is Jerry St. Peter. I head up the ophthalmology business for Sun Pharma which is called Sun Ophthalmics, which is a dedicated business unit uh, in the United States. And uh, Sun Pharma is the fifth largest global specialty generic pharmaceutical firm in the world. They have over 30,000 employees, over 2,000 products of innovation have been brought to market. And they are operating in over 150 countries and their worldwide headquarters are in Mumbai, India. And at this moment, with the foundation of success that Sun Pharma has been able to create, they are starting to make the strategic maneuver into the branded space, not only in ophthalmology, which is happening right now, but simultaneously, at the same time, they're entering into the neurosciences, oncology, and also dermatology, biologics, all at the same time together. So it's a big move for the organization, and they're thrilled to be in the ophthalmic space. Great, and ophthalmics is in what country currently? Uh, currently, they are the number one in prescription volume in India, number two in revenue in India for branded ophthalmics, and the foundation of Sun Going Global is starting in the United States where we're building piece by piece the business, achieve success, earn success here, and then start looking uh, strategically in other parts of the world as we move forward. Okay. Bob? Thank you. Uh, Robert Dempsey, head of Shire's uh, Emerging Ophthalmic Franchise. Um, Shire is based in Boston, Massachusetts, as well as in Zug, Switzerland. We have approximately 22,000 um, uh, employees. We recently, uh, during the course of this past summer, acquired Baxalta. With the acquisition of Baxalta, Shire became the leading company in the rare disease space. So our focus is not only rare disease, but also specialty pharmaceuticals. Um, with that, we have approximately 50 programs in development from an R&D perspective. We have a global presence um, currently right now in approximately 100 countries. We have a market cap of approximately $55 billion. So as we enter the ophthalmic space, we are well financed to um, expand our portfolio and have successful launches of products such as Zydra. Thank you, Amit. Yep. Cal, Valley. So I'm Cal Roberts from Bausch & Lomb. Bausch & Lomb is the eye care group within Valiant Pharmaceuticals. Valiant is, does about $10 billion a year of sales. Bausch & Lomb consists of about 40% of that, so say about $4 billion of sales annually. Uh, Bausch & Lomb is the only fully integrated ophthalmic company. So we're the only company that has a surgical division a pharmaceutical division of vision care consumer all within all within one roof so uh we're in 108 countries we have 18,000 employees and how much of that is of the ophthalmics is surgical versus yeah so it's a, so it's about 40 40 20 so of that of that 4 billion it's about uh 4 40% of that is pharmaceuticals about 40% of that is surgical i'm so, i'm sorry it's vision care 20% is surgical it's about 40, 40, 20. Great. Ashley? Thank you. First, I just wanted to give a shout out to some of the godfathers of the industry. It was really nice to hear your stories, and uh, we are all benefiting really from your pioneering thoughts, so thank you. Um, so, good afternoon. Ashley McAvoy from Johnson & Johnson, and uh, you may know us as a contact lens company uh, under the name of AccuView. It's about a 30-year-old brand. Um, but Johnson & Johnson is about a 130-year-old business, um, and we had some early roots in intraocular surgery uh, through the advent of IOLABS. And uh, we like to say we're coming home again and coming full circle um, and really rejoining the ophthalmology community. Um, we have big ambitions to really serve many more patients around the world, and we really want to actually take advantage of what we think are some really neat convergent technologies 
that maybe involve a surgical procedure or may involve an active you know, API or may involve the power of a brand, whatever it takes really to get patients engaged in their own eye health um, and really make sure that we have very highly qualified surgeons and healthcare professionals around the world. And, and since it sort of defines you now, why, why AMO? What was it about that fit that was so good that led to the, the vision that you that J and J has for ophthalmics? Sure, no. We have. Um, so let me let me give a welcome because I know there's a lot of AMO colleagues out there. Um, hope, hoping that you are all come join Johnson and Johnson soon. We, um, you know, we're in the middle of, of pre-close right now, Emmett. And so, we, you know, huge respect for AMO. Obviously, the number two surgical leader around the world. Very strong cataract franchise very strong number one refractive franchise, and um, we really think that they've got some nice differentiated technology, nice global footprint, and we really think the marriage with some of the Johnson & Johnson assets and AMO can, um, can really serve some patients in some new remarkable fashions. So why did you pick a largely device as opposed to a, a drug company to acquire, for example? Why did you, why was that a better fit? So I, I think we, um, and I, actually Cal had mentioned, so Johnson & Johnson actually has a very active cell therapy program for the treatment of geographic atrophy in Johnson & Johnson. Uh, we work very collaboratively with our pharmaceutical partners, and so we were very keen to enter cataract surgery, the number one medical procedures we all know done around the world. Uh, still think there's significant unmet need in cataract. Um, and as we heard this morning, a lot of emerging technologies that can really add superior value to patients. Great. James? So first off, it's very rare. It's hard sitting here. I'd much rather be over where you are. I can sit there if you like. I, I don't know. Right I'm not used to sitting here. And so I'm Jim Mazo, and I've been with Zeiss for 60 days. So I'm going to read a lot of these answers okay. to you. No. Um, Do you want Al to read it for right? you? Because I'm learning it. every day. So tell me if I get this right. And by the way, nice job on AMO. Thank you, I, I've heard a lot of good things about that company. Um, <laughs> Uh, so Zeiss, you know, this actually, you've heard me say it's the best kept secret in ophthalmology because you're probably going to be uh, unaware of these facts. Uh, over $5 billion in revenue, um, the Zeiss company, 60 countries, 30 manufacturing facilities, over 30,000 employees, and the med device business is over $1.2 billion. 55% uh, of the shares are held by the Carl Zeiss uh, Meditech Group. And we have over 3,500 employees. And so the whole philosophy that uh, I've known Zeiss because I competed against them and now pleased to be part of the team is that really the company has that diagnostic to treatment therapy. We diagnose and we can treat. And very rarely in our industry can you have where you have both helping the physician diagnose and now helping treat. And it's been a lot of fun uh, to be part of this company uh, with the heritage of 150 years, Carl Zeiss celebrated his 200th birthday. I wasn't around at the time, but I heard he was a hell of a guy. Great, thank you. Let's have uh, the first question um, from the slide deck to follow the photos, and we'll try to do this as organically. Can we have the first, next slide, please, from the back? Uh, okay, so I wanna just give some thought to, we have, we have uh, Sun, for example, which is India-based uh, originally, and then and we have a European-based company with Zeiss. How do you think about entering the U.S., staying in the U.S., staying in ex-U.S., how, how does that, how's your business? Is it U.S.-centric or not? How's it going to grow? What is it going to be in five, say, ten years? How would you like to see the U.S., ex-U.S. markets evolve over time? And how do you think about sort of both innovation and just growth at the top line? So let's start with, with Sun. So as I mentioned in the introduction, you know, Sun is an India-based company. So the foundation of the building and the strength of the organization comes from India. And I think the goal and the strategy and the direction they're taking entering the US right now is well planned, well thought out, and it's a major goal and it's the direction they wanna go. There's not a greater market to be involved in, as everyone knows, in the United States. With the value you're able to generate, the innovation is there, the opportunity is there. So you know, looking at the way that our company is playing globally. We're taking our roots in India, which has been extremely successful. We're now entering the United States, which is a core piece of our growth strategy. We're gonna lay down the foundation of the branded business within the US, and then we're gonna look to exploit those opportunities, and when we are opportunistic, when those come to be realized, 
we'll start ex extending our tentacles out into other areas. So the U.S., because you view that as the source of innovation to support the branded approach that you're moving to? Sure, because, you know, you look at the different markets. Take India, for example. You know, it's all about volume play in certain countries outside the United States. You know, with the prices of pharmaceuticals in the United States and the value you're able to generate with the innovation, it's that, it's that prime launching pad to take a company from point A to point, you know, to point B when you're building out a global picture. So that's the way that the thinking of the company was is, yes, they're based in India. That's where their, their initial success was. But the next phase of growth and the way the company is going to go from the current valuation today, which they do about $5 billion in revenue, depending on the day, the market cap of $30 billion, that's going to be the, the, the growth trajectory of the company, which starts in the U.S. because of innovation and also the ability of what value you get for the products on the market. And now, just before we leave you, I'll just ask one last relevant question, which is how does Sun view XUS as the source of innovation? We always talk about maybe innovation moving off seas to China, to India, to other countries. What's the, the internal view about that as a source of true, truly innovative products? You know, it's a very good question. And, uh, you know, there's, there's an additional set um, of business within Sun, which is totally separate, which is called Spark, Sun Pharmaceutical Advanced Research Center. It's a separate publicly traded company um, that is independent of Sun Pharma, the company, and their job and their role is to go out there, look at innovation globally, not just in the U.S., but throughout the world, and they're looking to exploit innovation, whether it's in the U.S. or the rest of the world, and there's, they're, they're, they are the R&D incubator for the business, which, with the innovation, they're able to bring, both organically or through M&A, we have the right uh, to negotiate and license that opportunity. So while the innovation is clearly in the U.S., where it's being invested in and where you're seeing that innovation come from, there are you know, pockets within India, Asia, where you're seeing uh, a wealth of opportunity of innovation that are being looked at. But again, I think when you, when you look for that opportunity, it's starting in the U.S. Great. Now, Bob, you've... Shire, right, this has been a very thoughtful process, and you and I have talked about it for a few years now, if not, half, if not five or more. Tell us how Shire decided to step into ophthalmology and what was the strategic thinking about why and then how to do it. Yes, so it's a rather interesting story. Um, our chief executive officer, Dr. Fleming Onskoff, who will be on the panel later with Jim, um, has an extensive experience in the ophthalmic industry. And when he joined Shire, uh, his first strategic acquisition was the, the purchase of, of Sarcode. So with that, Shire became a player in the ophthalmic space. And looking at the uh, amount of uh, unmet needs and the need for innovation, Fleming charged uh, Perry Sternberg and I to really build out the presence in the US. And obviously with the approval, the recent approval of Zydra, we are well on our way to launching this product. Um, but we also have a, a global vision as well. And you know, we look at the playbook that we've been able to accomplish over the last three years. You know, prior to the approval of, of Zydra, the awareness of Shire in the ophthalmic space was over 50% in the eye care community. We want to take that same playbook of working with the KOLs, working with the associations, having a large presence at uh, Congress meetings, both in Canada, in Europe, as well as Asia Pacific. So currently, we are in the process of building out those teams. Uh, we have um, uh, recently built out the Canadian team in the process of building out the, the European team and really want to take the playbook of how we feel we've been very successful in launching Shire into the ophthalmic space as our pipeline comes to fruition with programs for infectious conjunctivitis, glaucoma, uh, and then for uh, some specialty plays. We believe we're well positioned to take advantage of not only the U.S., but the global markets. Will there be any regions that you will not plan to enter? Um, very interested in all regions as long as there's a, a financial benefit to do so. So when we look at these markets, we'll conduct the ROI, see if it's worth investing, and if we believe it, it is, then we'll put forth the resources to do so. So Cal, your turn. You, there are two cultures came together here, Bosch and Loam and, and Valiant, and there's been this integration, this process, we'll call it. What, what's the shakeout of that? Where are you now? What does, what's your, the vision for Bosch and Loam? Sure. So first of all, a little history lesson on Bausch & Lomb. So Bausch & Lomb was founded in 1853. So that if somebody asks you what is the longest continually functioning <coughs> manufacturing 
company in the United States, you would say Zeiss. DuPont. <laughs> <laughs> I'll get there in a second. But then if somebody said, what's number two, you would say Bausch & Lomb. So founded in 1853 as an optical company, then, then had a deal to acquire Zeiss. And so in 1914, Bausch & Lomb had a deal to acquire Zeiss right before World War I. And the US government vetoed it because of the fact that they were concerned about US secrets going to Germany. So that deal, did, so that deal didn't happen. Uh, so Bausch & Lomb, then, so therefore, for the first 160 years, was a very US-focused company. And so the, the innovation was coming out of the US and then being pushed out into other regions. When we were acquired by Valiant, they came with a very different philosophy. They came with a decentralized model. And what that says is that let each region do the business the way they want to do it and not actually be governed by what's happening in the, in the US. And the result of that is that when I go overseas and I see what our business looks in other parts of the world, it looks very different. And mostly driven by the difference in regulatory environment in other parts of the world. And so when I was at ESCRS last month and looked at the portfolio of IOLs that Bausch & Lomb sells in Europe, and we see all these products with multifocals and trifocals, trifocals and blue blockers. Um, and it's really exciting because of the fact that the CE mark has different regulatory path than it is to get F FDA clearance. And so therefore, they have so many more products that works, works for them. Similarly, in Asia Pacific. So, that, so what, what the decentralized model from Valiant, just get to your, to your question, what the decentralized model has done is, is allow the senior management in each region to, to mold the company how best works for that region. Okay. Now, Valiant had a, a I don't, I'll just simplify it from an outsider perspective. Valiant has looked to prioritize revenue growth with, by acquiring commercialized products and perhaps putting less into a pipeline development internally, historically. Is that still the case and how is that, is it going to change going forward or how do you think about that internally now? Yeah, so uh, the businesses are very different when it comes to how you, how you innovate. So for example, in our contact lens uh, division, all the innovation occurs internally with the polymer scientists who are sitting there developing new, new plastics and our optical physicists who are doing that. That all happens internally and that is going as robust and as vigorously as ever. Similarly, when you get into surgical devices and the stores instruments, all that's happening in St. Louis with the development there really occurring the same way as it always has. Now, pharmaceuticals is different. And so pharmaceuticals, we have, we have gone the, the route of not doing the basic research in-house, but licensing it. And so a great, a great example of that is our Visalta drug, Latanoprostine Bunod, which is a drug that we <coughs> licensed and now did all the development work and we're looking forward to the launch of that drug. Um, and, so, and so the pharmaceutical area is an area where we really do to depend upon licensing and in licensing for the, for, for the drugs. So different than in contact lens or in surgical. And I think this is important. I'll come back to this end of the panel, but I want to finish with the pharmaceutical because it sounds like essentially, and correct me in turn for each of you, Nearly 100% of the, the pharmaceutical growth is going to come from the outside for all for each of you, almost. Is that true or untrue? You can start with. Well, certainly, certainly, as we look at it now, our pharmaceutical growth will come from the outside. Yes. I think it's um, probably 50-50 for Sun. You know, we have that affiliation, that relationship with Spark, which that is all organic development. They have an incredible. Uh, amount of expertise in developing uh, molecules from very early stage preclinical all the way up. So those are going to give us opportunities on the in-licensing opportunity internally, but also like we did last year with the acquisition of Insight Vision, which gave us late stage assets, and we're also very active in uh, considering M&A opportunities. So for us, it's going to be a hybrid mix. Same here. About 50-50. Yeah. Okay, 50. still a good number to, to, and means you need a lot of sources. Now, Ashley, back to the philosophy and, and uh, bringing com com companies together. J&J &J has a reputation for bringing in a company and allowing it to maintain its culture, its personality, uh, siloing almost, if you will, for want of a better term. 
Um, is that the case, and, and, and why? Why has that worked so well for J&J? Well, I think it's some of the topics that we heard earlier today about, um, you know, never losing your way and, and really staying focused on patient needs and customer needs. So, you know, I think like many other companies, as we grow up, we learn how to be really efficient in the back office, but really staying close to the marketplace and consumers. So that, those are really our guiding principles. We intend to maintain those principles as we as we work through the process with AMO, um, and we really want to stay nimble. You know, our biggest concern as a $70 billion healthcare company is to make sure that we, you know, aren't an artifact of the past, that we really are modeling um, a really agile organization of the future. So uh, a, a rigorous topic that we discuss maybe in three chairs um, in the J&J office to make sure that we're lean and agile and, and really customer focused. Thank you. What's the vision for growth for Zeiss? Well, you know, I, I looked at that question, Emmett, and I would say that my three mentors who were earlier here, Gavin, who hired me, David, who nurtured me, and Bill, who yelled at me, um, I, I would challenge that question because I think that that is maybe a, an older thought process. Um, I don't believe in U.S. or ex-U.S. I see two very good friends there, uh, Roger and Roberto Zaldivar. I don't see them as ex-US physicians. I think today, that's where you make the mistake. Cal said it perfectly, we have products that are maybe in some markets that are not, but the minute you start to think of US and ex-US, I think you really start to lose the cultural sensitivities, but you tend to lose the leverage across the markets. And we have to leverage our product line, we have to leverage our education, so I personally say that if we're weaker in a market, it's not the market's fault, it's our fault. Now, I would say for Zeiss, the U.S. is probably our, our uh, less important market strictly from a standpoint because we haven't executed to that level yet and we also don't have all the products. Um, but I don't like that U.S. x U.S. I lived overseas for 14 years and, and the three gentlemen I talked about would have killed me if I'd have said, hey, I've got an ex U.S. market and, an, and a U.S. market. They would have just said, how are you doing fundamentally with the customer? And I think that's where I, I really stress to Zeiss, we're not a German company. We are a global company that happens to have a headquarters in Germany, but we have a headquarters in Dublin, California. We, have, God love it, live in Italy. And that's how I like to look at the company of Zeiss. So now I'm in trouble with you, right? So I don't get any more, qu I don't get not, any more I'm questions. Gonna I don't I'm get not going to argue. I, I think it's, about this guy? It's, it's clear that there are different challenges in different regions, but we can not talk about those today. I, I would just echo, because I think that in today's world, what we're seeing, Emmett, I, I concur completely. Our business model ideas that are really you know, traveling the globe. And I use an example in China, and it's about patient continuum. So it's not just about treating the 80-year-old grandmother who's going to go in for cataract surgery. It's around going to the 40-year-old daughter who's really the gatekeeper of childcare throughout the family, whether that be from myopia control all the way through glaucoma management. And, and that's equally relevant in China as it is in the United States. So I'm, I'm starting to get really excited around how some business model innovation is traveling from Japan to the Middle East and Turkey or to China or to the United States. Now, I will say one thing that does concern me a bit to your last point is that we used to think in devices that Europe was the first market because of the CE mark. I think we all realize now that the notified bodies are under a major change. We're, gonna, we're not going to see the CE mark be the first market. Um, because the notified bodies, 50% of them will be out of business over the next year. Uh, so I think we have to think about what will be the first market you go to. But I, I like to tell our team what's the second, third, fourth, and fifth, not just concentrate on the first market. Yeah. Well, as a point, and then we'll go on to the next question, there are some large pharmaceutical companies that have put their innovation centers, R&D centers, in cities that are known for, as innovative cities, like Boston, San Francisco, et cetera and Shanghai and, and Mumbai, et cetera. And so, you know, is there, are there moves to, to cultivate that innovation offices? That, that was the point I was getting to, but I understand that it. uh, it's mostly U.S. Uh, and global at this point. Let's go to the next question. Um, how do you think about internal versus external um, innovation? We talked about this, I think, for, for the pharma end of the panel, but Jim, how, how much do you look outside to bring things in? And what are, are there any special challenges with a Zeiss-type product line for bringing in outside innovation? Well, you know, the, the, 
I've had a nice uh, 36 years in this industry. I started with Allergan, a uh, big company, then I, we created AMO, and then I went to four small companies, uh, and now I'm back with a large company. And what I learned along the way is that that innovation at that small company is really something I'd love to bring into that large company, that fail fast mentality, that entrepreneurial spirit. And so what I think, when I look at internal versus external innovation, I would say yes. Um, the not invented here syndrome is what kills companies. The minute you think you have the smartest people, guess what, your competition that's well represented here will outpace you. So we spend about 10% of our revenue on R&D. But I would say that the, uh, that the minute you start quoting percentages, I think is a mistake because what the hell does that mean, 10%? What's, what's the return on that 10%? So we look at both internal and external, and what we say is we're going to focus on these areas internally, and then we're going to look <coughs> externally. But if somebody's smarter than us, we'll take full advantage. I've got a full team here now, and you've seen we've changed. The greatest uh, strategic focus for us right now is refractive, or presbyopia, retina, glaucoma, dry eye. Why? Those are four chronic areas, really unmet needs and devices, and so I want to be where the market is going to be bigger. I'd rather be 60% of a multi-billion dollar market than 90% of a small market, and those will be the four areas we're going to focus on more, internally and externally. So, as, you, as I'm sure you're aware, the thought leaders much more often use the diagnostics and treatment devices than they think about developing drugs. And they have many, many ideas and insights that they think are novel and could advance the, the field. How do they uh, translate those innovative thoughts into working with a Zeiss to, to make that a reality? Or is that, well, how do they do that? Well, we're a drug-free company. Um, and so our point about devices is that if you think about it, think about the retina. What's going to get that drug to the back of the eye? It's going to be a device. Uh, if you think about a lot of the technologies we heard about today, and, I, and again, nothing wrong with pharmaceuticals, devices are going to play a much greater role. So at Zeiss, we want to make sure that we diagnose and then develop a device that can help treat those diseases. And if we have to partner with a drug company to be able to do that, far better for both of us. Because again, the customer could care less how we're organized. All the customer wants to ensure is that they have the technology to be able to take care of their patient's needs. I'm using your, your imaging machine, whatever it is, and I say, I have software that'll make it so much better. What should I do with that? Give me a call. <laughs> okay. Number, Let number me know. will be up on the Let next slide. Let me know, slide. we'll, we'll try to keep the price low. Um, but no, actually, you're, you bring up a very good point, and I, don't, I, don't, I will say my last point here. Uh, I'm taking his time. Um, the software actually is something we don't do a very good job on. I would like to create, and I think we need to hire some younger people to understand how to develop software. I think software is the greatest change for innovation in our industry. And from the innovator side, it's among the hardest things to protect. Yes. And we worry so much about, I, I'm not a software programmer, but pro programmers worry so much about losing their, their inspiration when they go to the company. So that is the dilemma for, for many of them. Ashley. How, how, how do you all think about uh, growing this innovation? I, I know you're in the middle of digesting something, but, or getting up to digesting something now, but how do you? Yeah, no, I mean, I, I would say I can't think of, quite frankly, any program inside our eye health area in J&J that's exclusively made within Johnson & Johnson. So, I mean, I, I think that is a little bit of the new model. We need to have the right competency and expertise to know what good looks like, to go hunt for those good partners, but that is a little bit of the new way of we work. I, I would come back to your comment around how are we going after innovation, and I think we've changed our focus because we've been so focused, let's say, just on the implant side or the, the polymer and the monomer side, or uh, we've been focused of just from a procedural point of view. But some of the significant advancements that, quite frankly, we've had to skill up on are all the significant advancements that have helped in, in HIT, in healthcare information technology, and in the advent of sensors. And you know, the example I'll use is we have a, an electrophysiology business in cardiac, and we took some of those engineers and we said, you know, we're really trying to solve the anatomy and diagnosis and navigation in the sinus cavities. And um, that anatomy is somewhat different, but also somewhat analogous into the eye health in, you know, cavity. And so diagnostic and navigation is super important in the future for precision um, and, and drug delivery. 
And so I think what we're starting to understand is really figuring out um, the, the search and reapply both outside of the company and inside the company. Great. Uh, we are out of time. We have, I thank the panel for uh, great responses. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.